So what's the definition of the domain? All the inputs. OK, we'll put it together. All of the inputs. OK. To be really specific by being general. Because we say x is, what if x is the letter you use? And we just say the input. We don't know that we mean all the inputs. So that's why just being a mathematician about it. So the inputs, in an ordered pair, which one is the input? The first one, and the output, the second one. And so to find all of the inputs, we look here. And if there were a clever way to say all those numbers without just writing a list of them, we would. But uh, I don't see any clever way to do that. So we'll just say negative 7, negative 3, 1, and 2. Okay. So similarly, the range is what? What's the definition of the range? All of the outputs. All of the outputs. All the things that come out of a function or of a relation. Okay. So that's all of the second ones. All right. So this is clearly a function, right? Because what's the rule? For functions, what what is a function? They all have one output. All have one out. All inputs have one output, not zero and not two and not three, but one exactly one. So is this a function? Yes. All right. What about this? There's two arrows going to that guy. Each input has its own output. Every, every input has its own output. Or, well, to say its own, maybe. Well, yeah. One. Input. What one? Yeah, you have one. It doesn't have to be unique, it doesn't have to belong to that input uh, solely, but as long as this input isn't going to two things. This one, on the other hand, negative one goes to negative one, and negative one also goes to negative five. Not a function. It's confusing. If I get negative one, what am I supposed to turn it into? Negative one or negative five? What's the rule? Well, there's not really a rule, apparently. Um, let's graph the function. We'll we're going to talk about graphing lines today specifically and slope and y-intercept and all that kind of stuff. If we were to pretend like we didn't know that, and we're just graphing this with complete cluelessness and not knowing what it was supposed to look like, uh, how would we graph uh, a function that we're not sure what it looks like? What would you do? If I gave you an equation and it said, Draw the graph that this equation makes. What would you do? No ideas at all? So I gave you an equation, like that one, or, or any one, at y's and x's, uh, and I said, draw the graph that comes from this function. I will put an x and y line on the paper first. Okay, that's a good place to start. Put an x-axis and a y-axis. Then what would you do? Start graphing. Start graphing. How do I start? What is a graph? What is a graph? How do I know that, that this graph is the graph that belongs to that equation? It is a graph. It is a good question. If you don't know that, maybe I'm not directing it just at you. Anybody who doesn't know that, maybe you don't know what a graph is exactly. not known what a graph is. Just from the early days of graphing, where you just put some points on the graph. Uh, there we go. That's not insignificant. It's significant. Uh, we just plug in numbers. Where do we plug them in? In x. And where do we get them out? Y, right? And it, it's, it's not really like it goes in, it comes out. We put something in there, we, we do the arithmetic, it all simplifies down to one value, and that one value is equal to y, so that's your output. Okay, what numbers do you put in for x? Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The only thing that would matter about uh, what numbers you put in for x is if, if something bad could happen. But something bad that could happen when you put a number in for x. Not here, nothing bad can happen in this function. What, can it, what bad could happen in some other function? We talked about it last time. What are things you just can't do in math or don't have definitions? Can't have a number over zero, for example. You can't have a number over zero, exactly. That's a good example. You can't divide by zero, so if putting a number in for x causes to divide by zero, we wouldn't do that. But that's not going to happen here. Any other examples? Things that 
don't cause us to get real answers. About a square root. Don't don't put in a square root of a number that has a doesn't have a perfect square. Just uh, that's okay. I mean, you wouldn't want to because it wouldn't be a nice answer. But yeah. it's not like you can't. Negative square root of a square root of a negative. Square root of a negative. I like how you distinguish between those two words. The square root of a negative. Well. It, it does exist in mathematics, but it's not real. That's what we call imaginary. So we wouldn't use square roots of negatives. And there's other things. Um, but those are the two typical ones that we'll see in an Algebra 2 class. So as long as we plug in values that are what we just described is, is limitations on the domain, as long as the things we plug in are in the domain of the function, in the set of inputs, then whatever we want to put in there will be uh, acceptable. Um, so what we want to do is really make it as easy as possible on ourselves. So what would be an easy number to plug in for x so that an easy number comes out? One. 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 Let's think about putting one in there. Put a one, and what will this be? Negative three fourths. Negative three fourths. Okay, so what? Wow, negative three fourths. One, uh, let's see, negative one minus three fourths. I mean, that's not the, the most difficult answer to find. It's negative 1 and not 3 fourths. But then to come in over here and graph it. What's it what are easy numbers to graph on the, the x, y plane? Whole numbers. Whole numbers. Or if we include the negatives, we call them integers, right? As long as they're right on the grid, those are the easiest ones to do, right? Where those lines intersect, right? So what's it, like the smallest numbers we can plug in for x? that would cause us to get out integers. Those are nice ones. They like to work with integers. Four. Four? Why four? Because the denominator of the fraction. The denominator of this fraction is four. If I multiply by four, what happens when you multiply a fraction with the denominator of four by four? If you get the denominator. Let me, let me write this down, because it's all up in the air here. I'm multiplying th negative 3 fourths by four, or 4 over 1, if that helps us to look at that. Cross. Yeah, they get the cancellation because they have a common factor that we, we chose on purpose to use 4. And so you just get the numerator, negative 3. Okay. What would be another nice number to put there? Maybe not 4, because we ought to use that one. Something that would also cancel. 2. 2. 2 would cancel somewhat, but there'd still be a 2 down here, and then we still have a fraction. Eight. Eight, eight would completely cancel this one because it has a full factor of four. And it's just four times two. That would also cancel the four. Okay, what's another one? Twelve. Twelve. Another one? Sixteen. Sixteen. See the pattern. Any multiples. Okay. Four. Multiples of four. Okay, any multiple of four? That sounds good. This is really just kind of a precursor to what we're going to talk about today. So those are those are good ideas. What's even easier than four or eight? What's the easiest number to multiply by? Zero. Zero is the easiest number to multiply by because it just cancels everything out. So we put zero in there. Right. So we have several points that we can find that are nice points, that are easy. We can plug anything we want to, but there's some, uh, some clever choices. Zero is a clever one. And put in zero, what do you get out? Well, negative just one. the leftovers. Negative, negative one. one, right? Negative one. Anybody remember what we call that guy? Right there on the y-axis. Y y-intercept. Yeah. Right there on the y-axis. I just want you to let it sink in. If you get it, great. If you don't, great. But don't say anything. But So if we, we were talking about how 4 would be a nice one to plug in there. So if I plug in 4, 4, there's 4 right here. That's not a point that I'm plotting, but just a marker that is 4. So negative 3 fourths times 4, because because this happens, that's a good thing, <coughs> minus 1. So we get negative 3 minus 1. So we just go over to 4, and we go down to negative 4. We just go over 4, and we go down 3 from that other point. Okay. Um, we could just keep doing that, couldn't we? We could just keep going those same steps over 4, and down 3, and we're down 3, and over 4. We could just keep following that pattern if we keep putting in 8 and 12 and 16. 
but all we need to be, we know this to be a linear function. How do we know this is a linear function? Talked about this last time too. Yes? Because it's in the mx um, minus b format. mx, MX plus we would, b format. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would say plus b, and then we would just say b is a negative one. Yeah. yeah. So y equals mx plus b. That, if you can get your equation into that form, a number times x plus another number, even if those numbers are negative, uh, then you have a linear function, one that if you graph it, it'll be a line. So we have two points, and we know it's a linear function, so we graph a line right through those two points. Questions from the quiz or questions from other homework problems? At least one question that you should ask before you move on. I just assume you know everything about it. Okay, I'm not going to hold your hands all the time, so you're going to have to ask questions in the future. But I know there's going to be questions about function notation. If there is, you should ask about it. You should be ready. You should come to class. You should have questions. Okay? Who feels like they're an expert at function notation? It makes complete sense to them. Nobody. So that's a question. So you should be thinking about these, these questions that you have before we move on. Before I just move into the next thing and I just assume you know what function notation is and what it means and how we use it. Okay? So if you don't ask questions, I am not going to ask questions for you. Except for this one time. And if you have more, you should think about it. So let's talk about function notation again. Now that you've heard me talk about it and you've tried to use it, if you got a little confused, now we'll come back. And we'll look at it again. Okay. So what would be really helpful is if you have a question about a specific problem. That way I can address the, the actual thing that was confusing. 34. 34. 2.1. thing might be confusing about this problem is, is this. This is the function. Here's the input, x. Here's what you do to x. And this is what we call the output now. Instead of y, we call it x plus x. The next thing you see is something I mean, related, but it's completely separate from this. It's not like you have to use these in unison somehow. There's that. And what they, this is like instructions they're giving you. And they want you to do that. There's that, and they want you to do that. So before I ask you what that means and how you do that, I'm just going to reiterate that y and f of x, they're the same. They're interchangeable. Instead of saying f of x, you could say y. We're going to move over to f of x and g of x and h of m and r of s and all these different things, these dysfunction notations. But all they represent uh, as you know, entities is the output of the function. It's all they mean. All right? Now this is a little more robust. It's a robu more robust way to talk about the output because we can name functions. We call them f and g and h and r. Instead of just calling them all y, like we have been doing, now we give them different names. Not only do we give them different names, we specify what the output is or it's not the output, but the input, the, the letter that you're supposed to use for the input, x in this case, could be anything. It could be m, s, r, t, uh, and it will be sometimes. Like in number 44, there's a function called v, and the input is s. Function called v, why is it called v in number 44? Because you're finding volume of a cube, v for volume. And s is the input because volume is a function of the side length. That means if you know the side length, that's all you need to know to find out what the volume is. As the side changes, the, side, the, le the length of the side of a cube, the volume also changes. That's what being a function of something else means. How do we find the volume given the side length? Well, with the side length, you would just multiply it by itself three times and you get the volume with that given side length. So that's just an example. We call it V and the input is S. 
S because S is the same as, you know, S side starts with S. And volume starts with B. So name and input letter. So all this is saying is name of the function, input. Name of the function, <coughs> input. It's not saying multiply this function by 8. Okay? This, this is probably the most common thing that I see. X plus 15 with an 8 right there. And then either multiplying 15 by 8 or maybe distributing the 8. And I understand the, like, the confusion because just two days ago, parentheses usually just meant multiply the thing in the parentheses by the thing outside the parentheses. That's not what it means in this context. In this context, it means function called f input of 8. Okay? And in this function f of x, where do we put things in? goes into x, because we just were told that x is where stuff goes in. So where 8 has replaced x, 8 will, on the other side, replace x. And so f of 8 is not x plus 15, it's 8 plus 15. So 23. Is that better? Does it make more sense? Yes. Can we go over 37 as well? 37. Yeah, it's a little bit weird. Okay, so the function called f, where if you saw the function f, you would put input into wherever you saw x. Where do you see x in this function? There isn't any x, okay? So, so x is over here, and it's going crazy, and it's changing from 1 to 2 to negative 17 to 25 to 103. What effect is that having on this function? None. It just is what? It is 6. No matter what x is, the output of this function will just be 6. It's the only thing that it can put out is 6 f of 2 is 6, f of 0 is 6, f of everything is 6 in this case. A little bit of a weird thing, but uh, it's good to cover. Okay. So let's talk about 44 just because, well, I chose it for a reason. Because this is V of S, it's volume given the side length is equal to S, S cubed. What does this if I were to find the number that this is equal to, what is the significance of V of 4? Once you find that number, what, what does that number mean? What is the significance of it? Yeah? V is the volume. That's what it signifies. And 4, like you said, it's the side length. OK. So I found out what, well, can you tell me what V of 4 is? Maybe that will clear it up some more. V of 4 is the volume of very good. So that's that's the end. I was trying to get to the middle. You jumped all the way to the end answer. If we wanted to find the number, the number would be 4 times 4 times 4, right? 64. That's the volume of a cube with a side length of 4. That's, that's what that is talking about. Just saying this is 64 doesn't mean anything. Saying it's 64 like units cubed, it's closer. What it is is the volume of a cube that has a side length of four units, whatever the units are measuring. Anything else? All right, let's pass in our uh,
some uh, interesting for the last two prisons you've done. I'm trying in the future to get them back to you it's faster than two at a time. I'll get them the uh, by next class. Today we're going to be talking about slope. Slope is something you probably, you, well, haven't used it yet. Shame on either you or your teacher. I'm not sure who, but you should have at least seen slope and be familiar with it and know that there is something out there called slope. Okay. Um, slope. What is the slope? Uh, what has slope? Lines have slopes. Okay, lines have slopes. And actually, this is a calculus idea, but everything has a slope, it just depends on the way you look. Like if we look at this curve, it has slopes, right? Mm -hmm. But the slopes is always changing. Right? This is pretty slopey. This isn't as slopey, right? The funny thing is, it's always, it's always curving, and so how do you find the slope of a curve? So that's, something, that's something we're figuring out in calculus right now. But it, the slope of that curve comes down to like little bitty lines. It's kind of like it's made up of a lot of little lines. Uh, just like uh, this circle right here. This computer can't draw a circle. What it can draw is lots of little lines. Okay? Just as small of little lines as it can make. Okay? But if I zoom in on that thing really, really far, at some point the computer cannot possibly have enough computer power to actually draw a circle. So it draws a lot of little lines. So uh, lines is what it all comes down to. Lines have slope. So what is slope? What is the slope of a line? What does that mean? What slope when line has five, when line has four, what does it mean? Yeah? Like the steepness of it? OK, there we go. Just throw some words out there, the steepness of it. It certainly is, is an indication of the steepness. It's not an indication of its length, is it? Mm -hmm. no, a line is infinitely long, okay? It's not an indication of its width or, or, or anything else. It is talking about steepness. Lines have lots of aspects to them um, where they are, right? Lines are in a place, and slope has nothing to do with that. It has to do with its steepness. How, how fast does it climb? How fast does it fall? Direction. It also talks about direction, yeah. The positive and negative slopes tell you which way does it point. Okay, positive slopes point in a certain direction, negative slopes point in, a, in another direction. Okay, so direction and also, as it's headed that direction, how steep is it doing that? How fast is it going in that direction? Okay, so what is the actual measure of slope? How do we measure slope? Rise over one. Rise over one, what does that mean, rise? How far? Okay, up or down. Rise is a vertical thing. Okay, how about run? What's run? It's a horizontal thing. So this vertical thing and this horizontal thing. Okay, we're getting there. Vertical and horizontal of what? Of x and y. I mean, rise is the how much you add or take away from the y core. Uh -huh. Run is how much you take away or add or get squared. Okay. Yeah. I gotcha. That's that's correct. Uh, okay. Let's let's get a little more concrete. There's a point. All right. Now there's a lot of there's a lot going on there. 
<laughs> okay. Well, what does the slope tell me? I don't know where it is, so I can't really add to the y and the x specifically. So uh, what does the slope tell me about the line if th this is what I know? I know that. Right. What, 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 is, what is this rise thing? Tells you where the next point on the line is. It's profound. Yes. Okay. Uh, it tells you where the next point on the line. Now, let's go back to the quiz. And I'll try and um, highlight something really important here. Let's leave those points that we found. And let's forget that we drew the line. Because I think that a, lost, a lot is lost by just drawing that line and saying, OK, I did. I drew the line. You gave me an equation, and I drew the line that the equation makes. OK? Um, what would happen if into this equation I put in 2? Could you tell by looking at this graph about what should come out of that function? And if so, could you shout out your estimate to me? About this, let me ask you this. If I put 2 into that function, will I get out? Positive one. Will I get out zero? Will I get negative one? How are you telling these, these, these yes or no answers? How do you know what comes out? Looking at the grid. You're looking at the grid? So you're telling me that what comes out of the function will put me right there on the line. Okay? Now that's that's not insignificant, but it's something that's lost on a lot of students, including myself in high school. I went through all of high school not realizing what a graph is. I just thought, here's a thing. It's supposed to make this shape. Here are the instructions for making that shape. But I did not see the connection. I did not understand. Okay? You put in x, you get out this y value. Okay. The, the thing that a graph does is it tells us all of the inputs and outputs, at least for this, these values of x. Okay. It doesn't go on forever. We can't draw graphs that big. Okay. But it does tell us, at least for this, the, the size of the graph that we choose to draw, it tells us what we should expect to get out given what we put in. If we put something in, we should get this out. Okay. And that's, that's significant. We want to know all the solutions to this equation. What x and what y satisfy this equation? What do I have, when I put something in, what comes out? Or what values of x and y can I put in here that will make both sides equal? All of those points can be found, or all of those values, those x and y values, are found on this graph, on this line. Rather than having to solve it a bunch, we can draw, draw this thing that has these tendencies, and then we can know about how much. Uh, and if, if we could draw so precisely that there was no error, we could know exactly what the output is. And we wouldn't have to do any math or arithmetic. We can just go to the x and find out what the y should be. Okay. So I could go to 2 and I could get this point. Pretend there's no black line there. I'm just plotting points. And then if I go to 2.1, I would get a point. The you know, output would put me right there. And this next output would put me right there. And if I went to 3, I would get this. And I'd plot all these points. And if I could plot all the points infinitely close to each other, and I did that for all values of x in here, what shape would I wind up making? I wind up making a line. Okay. So it's not that there's two points, and then there's this line that goes through the two points. It's really, the, the line is a bunch of points. It's an infinite number of points, all drawn really close together. It's faster to just swoosh, draw a line through two points. Right? But any point that we can plot, any solution to this equation will wind up landing on that, on that line. So when we come over here and we talk about the slope, and we say, if I know the slope, I can find another point on the line, means that I can find another solution to that equation. So if the slope is 4 thirds, I can go up 1, 2, 3, 4, okay, and over 3. And then I know that if I can draw the straightest line possible between these two points, I'll be also picking up all the solutions between here and there, right? And I could do it again, and there's a solution. 
and all the solutions between those two, that line catches all those two. All right, well, let's say, uh, let's, let's erase this, and now the slope could be anything. Maybe it's 4 thirds, maybe it's 5 sevenths. We don't know, it's not specific enough. Okay. Um, we'll say this is 2, 3, and this is 5, 9. Okay. We want to know the slope. We want to know the rise versus the run. We want to know that ratio. Um, first part of it is the rise, so we'll talk about the rise. Okay. And then we'll talk about the run. The rise is from one point to another point on the line, how far up you have to go. So how would you figure out, knowing these two points are on the line, how would I find the change, the vertical change from one point to the other? calculate that given what I know. Anybody know how long that red line segment is? Screen. Hoping that I just say, okay, here's what we do. I'm just really waiting on you to use what I'm sure you have, you know, all the capabilities necessary, and what you know about points, and what the x and the y about the, the coordinates mean. Tell me how long that red line segment would have to be. So that the red dotted one, straight up. Yep. Six. Six. How did you get there? I subtracted three from nine. Why? Why would that tell you how long that red one is? Because it's like if you started at zero and went up six, it would be the same height. You just instead you started at three. Well, so if you went up, if you started at zero and went up a height of six, then those two would be equal lengths. Yeah. Okay, but how do you know that? Six equals six. <laughs> how do you know this is six? I don't know if this is six and something else is six, they're equal to each other, but how do you know this is six? Nine minus three is six. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Nine minus three is six, and the length of that red thing is six. Okay. But what, what leads you to do that? Why don't you do... 4 minus 12 to figure out how long. There's no 4 or 12 up there. Okay, so the 9 is this 9, yeah. and 3 is this 3. Okay. Why did you use those? Well, why didn't you do 5 minus 2? Because 5 and 2 are the x's. Okay, so now we're getting at that these are y values, and y values are vertical, vertical things. Okay. <laughs> that makes more sense. How vertical is this? 
Three. is this point. Nine. From, from here. Nine. It's nine. How vertical is this point from here? Three. 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 Okay. And it's just vertical, right? So if, if this is zero, and I know that I'm three away from the wall, or three whatever. <coughs> and let's just say it was three feet. So if I was three feet away from the wall, and you were nine feet away from the wall, how far away are we from each other? Yes. Six. Because you're nine, right? From the wall to you is nine, and from the wall to me is three. So if I take off the distance that I am from the wall, and we get the distance left from you to you. Same thing here. That's just two. Hmm? The next one would just be two, wouldn't it? Right, the horizontal distance. The horizontal distance would just be two. It is not to scale at all, but uh, that would be two. It would have to be. If this is two, this dot right here is two away from the y-axis, and this one is five away from the y-axis, then in between them would have to be three. You take this big distance right here, which we're saying is five, and we take this small part right here, which we're saying is two, well, then two plus the leftover should be five, so five minus two gives us three. And it's, it's like that with anything. Anything where there's uh, a, an initial and a final, like I start at three and I end at nine, and then I must have gone six. If I start at two and I go to five, I must have gone three. Five minus two, this distance five minus two gives us that distance three. Okay? Now, we've gotten that information. We've gotten the information that this is six and this is three. Six over three. Huh? Or just two. Or just two. So six over three, or two over one, or just two. These are all representatives of the slope of this line. How slanted it is, how steep it is. Okay. Um, would that work? What about if, if this point wasn't two, three, but it was down here, down below the x axis, like negative? Would that still work? Could I just take this y minus that y? Still going to work? Would you have to add it? Okay. Let's see. Let's say this is at three, three, uh, five, five. Okay. And this one's at one, negative two. Okay. So what we did here was just take hey, this guy minus that guy, nine minus three, that's the distance between the two, okay? Well, you, you can look at this. What is the vertical distance from here to there? It's what? Seven. Seven, yes, it's, it's five and another two. To get from here to there, you'd have to go through five and you have to go to another two. So would it work just to take five minus this other guy? Let's see, five minus what? Negative two, so we do wind up adding it but only because the negative times the negative is positive. We don't have to fix anything. It all works out. Even if the thing is negative, what happens is by subtracting, you wind up adding it on to that vertical distance. This goes the full five. And then you go two more, and that's what happens when you subtract. So it doesn't matter if some of them are positive, if some of them are negative, even, even that, you still will get the distance between the two. Okay. Um, so if we generalize this to say, here's a point, and here's a point, we'll call this the first point, and this the second point, and this point has an x and a y, and this point has an x and a y, we're trying to generalize it, right? So we take this y minus that y, but then that's going to be confusing because it's going to look like y minus y. You gotta figure out a way to, to unconfuse that. How do we, when we try to take this y, this y right here, and subtract this y right here so that we can find the vertical distance? That's confusing. It shouldn't come out to be, well, in most cases, it shouldn't come out to be zero, but this, the way it looks, it looks like it should be zero. So do you remember how we distinguish between this y and that y? A one and a two. Here's point one, so let's call this a y from point one. 
And this is point two, so we'll call this a y from point two. So there we go. So it all just depends on us naming one of them point one and the other one point two. That's where our y2 and y1 come from. So now y2 minus y1, that's better. Those, those are different things, probably. Okay. Sometimes the y's can be the same, but that would be on a horizontal line. x2 and x1. Well, see, the thing is, we want to go from here to there vertically. Okay, so we want to get that distance from there to there is whatever y two minus y one is. Okay, and we want to also know this distance right here. So we wouldn't know like the steps to go from here up and then over to get to there. Right, but if we're not careful, what could happen? Like this one, if we, if we do five minus two, we get three, it is a distance of three. I do have to go to the right three to get from here to there. But if I did two minus five, what would I get? I get well, negative, negative three. three, and then like I would be telling myself to go to the left three at that point. Okay, so you have to be careful that you get the, the order correct. Okay, if I'm gonna start here and end there, I'm going to do y2 minus y1 because I have this, whatever this y distance is, minus whatever this y distance is gives me this y distance. And I'm going to take this x distance right here, minus this x distance right here, to get this x distance. Okay, so I'm going to do x2 minus x1 and not the other way around. The important thing is that these two guys make up one of the points, and these two guys make up the other point. One of them is not mandated to be one and the other one to be two. You choose. Point one, point two, it doesn't matter. I'll prove it to you. Uh, we did, um, what did we do? We did min nine minus three and then five minus two and we got two, right? So we can go up two and over one, up two and over one to get the next one. But what if we did three minus nine? over 2 minus 5. Now we just get negative 6 over negative 3, and that's still 2. So both of them will switch signs, and it won't be any different. So this is slope. Slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now I'm sure this is not the first time that you've heard y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. But it might have been the first time you asked yourself why that is. Why is it y2 minus y1 over y2 minus x1? Okay. It's pretty simple. It's because for any two points, the y value from this guy, y2, minus the y value of this guy, we can call it y1, gives us this distance right here because this big one minus this small one gives us the leftover. And the same for the x's. The x for this one, x2, minus the x for this one, x1, will give us the distance right here, this horizontal distance. So there it is. There is the, an explanation behind why it is that way. So let's get some practice. We'll do number five. The thing that I want you to be careful about is this just recall one of them point one and that stays consistent. And then we call the other one point two, and then that stays consistent. And that the x and the y from the second point are are both they both come first, and the x one and the y one they both come second.
careful. Call one of them point one and the other point two. Make sure this is x1 and y1, x2 and y2. Then I could have called that one two and that one one. It doesn't matter. I just want to make sure it stays consistent. So y2 minus y1 over stay here. This is going to be the first point. Eight minus five. Negative five. Three. Negative five six. So now it talks about whether the line rises or whether the line falls. Okay. Uh, well, a rising line from left to right would go up. We read from left to right, so a lot of the things that we talk about are in reference from left to right. From left to right, we can see this line rises. And from left to right, this line, we would say, falls. It's a little bit arbitrary which one we say rises and falls. It's just from left to right, and that's, I think that's how we read is why we do that. This one falls from right to left. This one rises from right to left. Okay, But our reference is from left to right. So why do you always have to be on the top? Or could it be like um, 8 minus 5 over negative 4 minus 1? Uh, it can't be that. It is always the vertical over the horizontal, rise over the right. We'll see yeah, in a little bit. Find out next week. Okay. Um, this one rises, this one falls. The question is, does something about the slope, after we calculate what the slope is, does something about the slope tell us whether it rises or if it falls? Is it like bigger than one? Is that what we're looking for? Is it you know, anything bigger than one rises? Is it anything that's smaller than one falls? Is that what it is? Let's see. Let's start at this point. Right. We're gonna let's say we, we're gonna get to this point using the slope. All right. We start from here. In which direction do we go? Up. Go up. Okay. Well, we, we could start at a point here. We could go up on this one too. We just you know go this way after that. So if we're gonna go up and we're gonna stay on a line that rises, which which direction do we have to go now? Right. Could I possibly go to the left from here and wind up getting a line that rises from left to right? No, if I go to the left, I'll get a line that goes the other way, goes falls. So we have to, to get from here to there, if we're going to go up to start with, then we would have to go right. Okay. If we go up, what is that, positive or negative? Positive. And if we go from there to the right, what's that, positive or negative? That's positive. So the rise is positive, and the run is negative. Or sorry, positive. So positive over positive? Is positive, right? Positive slopes are associated with rising line. Uh, even if we went the other way, if we started here and we went down, what's that? Negative or positive? Negative. Negative. And then could we go to the right from here and have a rising line? No. Gotta go to the left. That's a negative. Negative over negative. Positive still, still a positive. So to have a line that rises, you would have to start at one point and go up and to the right or down and to the left. Either way, you get a positive. Positive slopes rise. And without taking as much time as we did, if we have a point here and here, down is negative. And to the right is positive. You have to go to that. If you go down, you have to go to the right then to have a line that falls. Well, negative divided by positive is negative. That's a negative slope. If we start here and go up, then we'd have to go to the left. If we're on a falling line, we go positive and negative. Positive or negative is a negative slope. Okay. So rises, that means we have a positive slope. I'm going home. Going again? Not all. Well, like, um, I'm skipping practice. Oh, you're getting out of it. Uh, this would be a negative slope. Negative slopes, negative slopes uh, are associated with falling lines. Positive slopes rising, negative slopes falling. Um,
Let's, let, we'll stay on the same page to talk about uh, vertical and horizontal lines. So, that's good. Uh, here's a horizontal line. Let's talk about what kind of slope horizontal line is. A rising line has positive, falling line has negative. Horizontal line, it's not rising and it's not falling, it's just staying even keel, right? Okay. So it has no slope. It has, in a way, it has like no steepness. Okay? But, uh, you know, there, there are points here. There's a point. There's a point. And if we did the, the slope formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, we get something. Right? We get some result from that arithmetic. What would happen? How, what would happen there? Let's think about in terms of rise over run. So if we're going to go from here to there, how much am I going to rise? None. So the rise is worth how much? Zero. Zero. Rise over run starts with zero over. Well, how much do I go over? X. X amount. You know, we don't know. It's uh, it doesn't really matter. You you will go up nothing, and you could go over a million, or you could go over three. You still are on a horizontal line. So we go over, who knows? What's zero divided by who knows? Zero. Still zero. Zero divided by anything is zero. So that's horizontal. How about vertical? Is vertical also zero? <laughs> they can't both be zero. That doesn't make any yeah. sense. Zero has to be horizontal, and so vertical has to be something else. Let's think about rise over run again. How much do you rise? No. I don't know. Let's let's say we rise. Okay, whatever. I, I'm, I'm not sure. That's up in here. How much do you run? None. None. Okay. So whatever the rise is, it doesn't uh, really matter because we're going to run zero. What what do we know about this here in this place in this fraction? Zero. Something divided by zero is zero. Take, okay, I'm going to take nothing, I'm going to divide it up into five pieces. Right, that's division, right? We cut it into pieces. So how many, how much is in each piece if I started with nothing? Okay, and I'm going to take all of you. I'm going to divide you into zero groups. How many people are in each group? But they're... But that would that would be like there was a group there's a group to count how many there are in, but you have no groups. Exactly. There are people. There are no groups. It's magic. Okay. Well math isn't magic. So if it's magic then it's outside of math. Math doesn't have a definition for it. This is undefined. That's what we call undefined. You divide by zero, you can't. There is no definition for it. Maybe in the future. I mean, literally, this could happen. I'm not exaggerating or being silly. You could decide what dividing by zero would mean. Okay? Just like the, the other day when we talked about negative times negative is positive, that wasn't immediately apparent when the first person tried to divide two or multiply two negatives together. They had to figure out what two negatives would have to be. And we proved it. We proved uh, very uh, definitely that it has to be a positive. But dividing by zero, we still, we keep looking at it, and then we just don't know what to make of it. There is no definition. It's not positive or negative. It's not anything within math. We don't have any definition. But in the future, uh, just like there was a time when they didn't know what negative times negative was, you know, we just don't know what dividing by zero is yet. And we'll decide in the future what it means. And that dividing by zero will fit within all of the math rules that we've made so far, and, and it'll work. But right now, there is no definition. Undefined. So a vertical line will have an undefined slope, or in other words, a slope that has a zero in the denominator. Because the rise is, or the run is zero. There is no horizontal movement between the two points. Okay, so that's a vertical line. No slope at all. <coughs> well, let's keep on moving here. Um, now we're going to talk about parallel and perpendicular lines. Parallel will be fast, perpendicular will spend a couple minutes on it. Here's a line. It's got a slope. It goes up and it goes over some. There's a rise and there's a run. All right, so here's another point. 
And I'm gonna draw a line through that point. I'm gonna draw a parallel. What does parallel mean? Okay, not intersect. Okay, I'll draw it real careful. So that in, in neither direction will I intersect this other line. Not up there and not down there. Okay. Well imagine the slope is like stairs, right? So let's say I'm building stairs at this particular slope. The stairs are this high versus this deep. Okay. The, the rise of the left. I would have to build this staircase so that it doesn't wind up either up there or down there running into the other staircase. Well, if I made these steps, uh, if I kept the depth the same but I built them too high, what would happen then? You'd run in, somewhere up here, you'd run into this other staircase. I'm proposing something preposterous that we build stairs and then stairs underneath those stairs. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. All right. Okay. So if we build the stairs really tall, but just as wide as these, well, up there we're going to run into the other staircase or the one's going to intersect. What if we build them uh, the other way, so that they're just as wide but shorter? What's going to happen then? They'll eventually connect down there, right? So what would we say about the the height versus the width of these steps? To be the same. The same. And so what about the lines have to be the same? The slopes would have to be the same. So if this is A and this is B, and I come over here and this is A, right? If I just make this A, this had better be B, otherwise they're going to meet up at some point. Okay. Fairly. Fairly intuitive thing. If we want the parallel lines, we have to have equal slopes. So parallel lines have equal slopes. Okay, but what we never have is parallel slopes. Okay, so a lot of you just misspeak and you don't really think about the meanings of the words you're using. You can't parallel slopes. Slopes are numbers. They're just telling you the ratio of the vertical to the horizontal. Parallel is something that lines are, actual physical objects, okay, or at least imaginary objects, but objects nonetheless. So number, object, we can't, don't really do that. You can't parallel numbers. Okay. All right, so I come over to, um, to perpendicular lines. Perpendicular lines. And we'll start with a red one. Okay, this one's red. And I'm going to draw a blue one. So this blue one is perpendicular. What does that mean, perpendicular? Not only do they intersect. At a what? At a 90 degree angle. So that's, that's the beginning of this little proof. 90 degrees. So I'm going to draw the slope of the red one and show that the blue one has to be something in particular. If they're going to be perpendicular. So the red one, I'm going to draw the slope of the So I'm going to draw it up this much and over that much. I can make it any size I want. The ratio of the vertical to the horizontal would stay consistent. It would always be the same. Okay. Let's call this A and this B. Right. So far, I haven't done anything spectacular. Just drew a vertical versus the horizontal. That's the slope. Right. Now I'm going to draw, for the blue one, I'm going to start to draw its slope. Okay. So I'm going to start with the vertical. Here I go vertical. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there because to me this looks like it is also a length of B. So this vertical is the same as a horizontal. I can draw that vertical any size I want, right? So I'm going to draw it to where it looks like it's B. We're going to say it's equal to B. Okay. Then we're going to come over here to get this other point. The thing we don't know is how long that has to be. So we have to prove how long that would have to be. So this is a question. I don't know yet. Okay, so now let's start to label some things. That's 90 degrees. What's the angle here? 90 also. Here? 90. Also 90. Now let's color some things in to make them easy to talk about. Yellow and blue. Let's call it blue. Grayish blue. OK. So we're going to go through a process of steps that shows that would have to be, well, something. That's something. OK. 
So how many, the total of all of the angles in a triangle is how much? 180. 180. Okay. So all of the, 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 uh, the angles in here have to add up to 180 degrees. Yeah? Same in here. Okay. How much of the 180 is this? 90. So how much is this plus this? 90. It's what? 90. Yellow plus blue then would have to be 90. 90 plus 90 being 180. Okay. And how much is this angle? This big one right here between blue and red? 90. 90. Okay. So this is 90. And what is yellow plus blue? Okay. Yellow plus something is 90. So what's this? It's also blue. Well, this is a triangle. This is 90, right? And the sum of these two have to be then 90, because the whole thing has to be 180, so these two have to add up to 90. Well, blue plus what is 90? Yellow. 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 Blue plus yellow is 90. Okay. Well, let's forget about this B thing for a second. So we have two triangles that definitely have the same angles, all the same angles. What do we say about two triangles that have all three angles the same? They're similar. They're similar. They're not necessarily congruent unless one corresponding side is the same, right? The hypotenuse is the same on both, or the longest leg is the same on both. So here, I just so happen to draw this guy, so it's also B. And it's a corresponding side, it's the longest leg. So this leg is B, all the angles are the same, so how long is this? Okay. Gotta be A. But if we're really technical about it, it's not really A, is it? What I'm trying to measure is how far it is from here to there. What direction is that? Negative. It's negative. It's negative. Okay. So what's the slope of this line? A over B. A over B. The slope is A over B. What's the slope of this line? Negative. Negative. It's negative. B over A. So this one's slope is whatever. This one's slope has to be opposite reciprocal. Opposite reciprocal. It's the opposite because this is positive. That's negative. And vice versa, that if we start with a negative one, this one has to be positive. And if this one is 2 over 3, that one has to be negative 3 over 2. They're opposite reciprocal. So per perpendicular lines have opposite reciprocal slopes. I guess we can spell that all the way out. Find two slopes in there. They're not only flipped over of each other, but they're also one's positive and one's negative. You got some perpendicular lines on your hands. Yeah. Questions at all? On that stuff? Rising, falling, vertical, horizontal, parallel, perpendicular. This is one way to write the equation of a line. f of x equals mx plus b, or y equals mx plus b, whichever you want to use. I'm trying to force function notation on you. This is called uh, slope intercept form. Why is it called slope intercept form? Because there's a slope and intercept form. Slope, which one's the slope? M. M and b is the what? Y. The y intercept, well, not just the intercept, but the y intercept. So, slope, y intercept. So, let's make up an equation. Y, we'll use y just to make it easier on ourselves for a minute. Y equals uh, 2 thirds x plus, well, let's say minus. Of course, this is negative. Minus 1. What is the minimum that you need? What's the minimum information you need to draw a line? Slope and y intercept. Okay, well, yes. 
But at its very core, what do you need to draw a line? So, so one. What's that? Two what? Two points. Two points. You need a point, and you need another point, and you draw a line between those, those two points. That's where you need two points. So all the stuff we're going to learn is just the easiest way to find two points. The easiest way to find two points in this situation, the slope-intercept form, uh, just happens to be the y-intercept and another point using the slope. Okay. Now here's why, though. We can put anything in there for x that we want, right? What's the easiest number to multiply by? Zero. That's why the y-intercept is such a convenient thing to find because all it requires you to do is put zero in for x. This goes away, and this is all that's left. That's why you use this as the y-intercept because if you put in zero for x, that's what the y is. So that's where it intercepts the y-axis, right there. So that's why that is. It's a convenient way to write the equation of a line because it's easy to find the y-intercept first. And now we go back to the thing that we talked about before. Let's say we're going to move this way. We're going to find another point to the right. Okay. Um, if you plug in one, you can plug in one, right? One would be all right. Two would be fine. Why is three such an attractive choice to plug in for x? We talked about it earlier. Because you can cross out three and two. Yeah, because, because now we're going to multiply by like a, a fraction with three in the numerator, which is going to cancel with that three in the denominator. Okay, so we're going to have two thirds times three is the next easiest choice because it's going to land us right on the grid, right? And then we subtract one. The threes cancel, making it so easy to just do two minus one, one, and so we're at one. So what did we do? We we went over to three. That's our run, right? Over three. Okay, and then all we did is we started at negative one, and then we added two more, the numerator of what we now call the slope. Does that make sense? You start at negative one, and when you, when you go over to three, you multiply that fraction by three, you're just going to add on two. Okay. If I go over to the next nicest number, six, which is three more to the right, three more for the run, okay. uh, well, I would start at, um, at one, well, let's say we start at negative one, and we're going to go up four, because when we put a six in there, we start at negative one, and we're going to cross out the three and the six. Now the six uh, is reduced to a factor of two, and now we have two times two, that's four. We go up two steps of two. We start at negative one, and we go up four. So really all we did was start from here, we move over another three, and go up another two. And we can just keep following this pattern, and there's your slope. Okay. So that's why the numerator is the y part, because it's like the, the denominator is the, the x. The x cancels with, with the x part, and the y is all that's left. I guess is the best, quickest way I could justify that statement. Um, so we can draw a line through there. We only really needed two. We could do the y-intercept and go up two and over three with the slope. We know that that's the pattern that's going to emerge out of that. Every time we put in a new, uh, like the next multiple of three, we're just going to add on another two. Another two because if we went on to uh, 12, we would add on four twos. Okay. Right. So easiest way to find two points is the, is the y-intercept and to use the slope to find a second point. So that one's called the slope-intercept form because it has the slope and the y-intercept. Now we're going to talk about the standard form. And it's called standard form for no reason. Not really a reason why it's called standard form. And you might read a different textbook and the slope-intercept form is called the standard form. Which is kind of up to the publishers of the book, really. So standard form is ax plus by equals c. Use an example. 8x plus 6y equals 24. Again, I'll maintain that the easiest way to draw a line is find two points. And you want to find the easiest two points possible. All you need is to find one point 
at another point, and then you can draw a line. You just need two points for that. Right. And so we're going to do that. Well, let's start by, we, we usually put these in for x, and so we might as well do that. All right. Let's, let's write it out this way. We're going to decide to plug something in for x. What's the easiest number to multiply by? 0. Why? How come? Way. Just anything times zero is zero, and so that zero becomes very easy to deal with. That zero in the in the the expression, if you multiply by it, you get zero. If you add something to it, nothing happens, right? So we put a zero in for x. That's very easy. This goes away. Okay. And how do we solve for y? If you divide by six, you're just left with this really simple equation. You can put anything you want in for x. But if you put in 1, you put in 2, you put anything other than 0, now you have subtraction to do and then division after that. But if you just eliminate it, all you do is divide by 6, and y is 4. Right? Now, we don't have to only put things, we can put things in for y and figure out what x is if we want to. But still, you know, that we're just saying what the output needs to be and figure out what the input would have to be. But do you think we might want to plug in for y? choice because the y part will go away. Put 0 in for y, this goes away, and how do we solve for x? Divide by 8, and x is 3. So we have here we have our one point and our second point. So here we just find our y-intercept, right? There's our y-intercept. Which one of these is the y-intercept? First one, zero for the x, you just go up on the y. Zero, one, two, three, four. Okay. And this one's called? The yeah. x-intercept. Because it intercepts the x-axis at three comma zero. And there we We're just talking about different ways to write the equation of a line. Y equals mx plus b, that's one way. It tells you the, the y-intercept and the slope. The standard form, you can easily find the two intercepts, the y and the x-intercepts, and draw a line that way. Okay. So now, what if I gave you an equation like y equals 5? I'm going to graph y equals 5. What would that look like? Horizontal line where? Up five. This is going really well today. Every other year, I have had confused students get this turn around backwards. Because what they do, what your mind does, and it's natural, is to say y is a vertical thing, so it must draw a vertical line. That's, that's not right, right. Because what needs to be true about this line? Every point on here, the one thing that needs to be true is this. So what needs to be true about every point? Y is 5. Is that true of every point on this line? Yeah, x I don't know, but I definitely know y is 5. Which means similarly that x equals negative 2 looks like what? Go over to negative 2 on x, and then draw a line. A line where all of the x's are negative 2. If we draw anything other than a vertical line, if it slants at all, this x over here won't be negative 2. This x over here won't be negative 2. All the x's need to be negative 2. That's our, our vertical line and our horizontal line. Those are the equations for both of those guys. Okay? Uh, so that's what I have. Do you have any questions? Can you need to practice? That's not a question. I can't argue with it, I guess. It just is what it is. Goodbye. Enjoy your weekend. See you now. You're a track? You're a track, you go. Cross country or whatever it is.
Let's get in there. Cross country. 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 Cross country.